And of course, these countries are taking into account in, in varying degrees the feelings and the attitude of their own people who are strongly sympathetic with the Palestinian people. Furthermore, we have also several countries which have large Muslim communities. For example, India have uh, around 163 million Muslims in it. China, at least there are 55 million Muslims in this country. Um, for Islam in Asia, uh, we have almost 1 billion, 150 million uh, by uh, 2010. And this means that almost 70% of the Muslims of the world are living in Asia. And in this case, you should see the weight of the Palestinian issue by putting in mind such figures. Besides, there are another 250 million Christians also in Asia, who also Palestine have such an important significance for them. So both religiously and emotionally, uh, we have such big figures who are putting the Palestinian issue of a special significance. Uh, and in this case, uh, the point here is that the majority of the people in Asia are feeling that Israel is a threat for stability and the peace, not only in the region, but in the world. And uh, the other important point here, just to make quick points uh, on the Israeli regime, is that Israel is being seen as uh, the last form of traditional colonization which still exists in the world. Also, Israel is the last country which still based its regime on racism. Uh, its laws are stab being established based on that, just favoring uh, only a sort of people, those are followers of such a religion. Even in West Bank, we have streets who are who cannot be used especially except by the Jews. So, and we have hundreds of laws of this country are based on just favoring the, the Jews and also discriminating others from their basic rights, which we don't have time, or unfortunately, to talk or to elaborate on that. Um, Israel is a country without official boundaries. Israel is a country without written constitution. Uh, Israel is a country which have more than 200 atomic uh, bombs. Uh, Israel is officially occupying others' land of the Palestinian uh, people uh, for the last, uh, I mean, land occupied in 1967, in which it goes against the whole resolutions of the United Nations and uh, what, yeah, whatever related to international law. But unfortunately, in this case, Israel uh, is being dealt with as a country above law. And although we have more than 530 United Nations resolutions in supporting the Palestinian issue, but never implemented. Uh, even for the peace process, the Israeli regime spoiled the two-state solution and, uh, uh, and uh, with such the peace process uh, came to a deadlock. So with such a case, uh, the Palestinian issue and the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian land and uh, the injustice inflicted on the Palestinian people will continue to be an issue which could explode any time in, in such a region and will, uh, of course, has its own strong impact, not only in Asia, but on the whole world. Uh, just for your uh, information, uh, although the Israelis are having such atomic bombs and uh, weapons of mass destruction, but they are now talking about uh, the Iranian, I mean, uh, uh, nuclear, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, developing their own uh, uh, nuclear refineries and so on, and that the Iranians hold a, a threat to, to the peace, even though the Iranians did not, uh, I mean, have one atomic bomb officially at least. Uh, so, with such a case, uh, and with the threat of the Israelis that they may attack Iran, you just imagine what would be happening uh, to at least the area of West Asia in the near future. Uh, the paper describes, uh, I mean, uh, in, in details, uh, many things related to Israel and stability in the region. I will not go uh, much on, on such details. Uh, but for Asia in general, my second point here, uh, people uh, on most of the countries of Asia maintained a very strong uh, support to the Palestinians and to the Palestinian issue, with few exceptions, uh, especially before 1990. And uh, just few countries have established their own uh, political relations with the Israelis. Uh, the big powers in Asia, um, China, India, and so on, maintain their very strong support to the Palestinian issue. However, we have almost two major changes uh, which were turning point in uh, dealing on the dealing of the Asian countries with the Palestinian issue uh, by the end of 1980s and the beginning of 1990s. What happened by 1991 is the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of USA as the leading power in the world. And in this case, many Asian countries uh, tend to develop their relations with USA and to concentrate on the economic matters uh, and, and importing the American technology and weapons. And of course, you know, uh, the major pillars of the American policy in the Middle East are two, oil and Israel. So as Israel uh, is a major pillar, pillar of the uh, American foreign policy, it, become, <clears throat> it became evident to these countries that establishing relations with Israel is the key for better relations with USA and getting, uh, I mean, good economic relations with them, with them and the Western technology and so on. This is number one. Number two is uh, the impact of the Gulf War of 1990, 1991-1991 with the American intervention and the American-led storm desert campaign, uh, which liberated Kuwait from the Iraqi occupation, uh, which has a very strong impact on the Arab world. Arab countries became in their worst situation and weakness, disunity and chaos. And this led to what is known as the Madrid Peace Conference in October 1991, uh, which brought Israelis, Palestinians, and most of the Arab countries, including Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, to the same table with the Israelis, resulting in starting the Palestinian-Israeli peace process. And this implies a tacit recognition uh, of Israel by, Arab, by the Arab states. And this allowed many countries in the world to establish diplomatic and economic relations with Israel without fearing from an Arab backlash. So such opening a relation, I mean, by the Arabs with Israelis and going for the peace process did encourage many countries to uh, have political relations with the Israelis. So just within one or two years after such a process, we have 71 countries. We have 71 countries who made relations, political relations with Israel. So this was a very big breakthrough to the Israelis uh, and to make relations with their economic and diplomatic relations with, our, uh, with, the, with the world. Most of the Asian countries or many of the Asian countries have or did establish 
such relations with the Israelis. Um, and with this case, uh, full diplomatic relations were established with uh, all almost uh, Central Asian countries uh, with Israel, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. All of them made relations. Uh, Jordan itself made also an uh, Wadi Araba official uh, uh, agreement with, with the Israelis and have full relations with, the, with them. Also some other countries made uh, economic relations, and, uh, but still not having full diplomatic relations with the Israelis. This was in 1990s. Some countries like Morocco, Tunisia, Oman, and Qatar have such relations. Uh, by year 2011, Israel managed to have or to establish itself with very active economic relations with Asian countries amounting uh, a foreign trade with Israel with, with around 32 billion US dollar in one year. Um, and this benefited very much the, the Israeli economic and its development in the region and where this such funds and, and strength, uh, strengthened the Israeli economy which was used against the Palestinians and which was used to maintain more of the process of Judaization and occupation and aggression of the Israeli regime. Uh, uh, in my paper, I have uh, two case studies of China and uh, India. Uh, uh, if I may try to make use of time, I, I may just concentrate on China as an example. Uh, of studying the case. Um, in general, talking about China, China was describing Israel, I mean, this was uh, between uh, uh, 1950 or 1949 till almost 1990. China was describing Israel as an imperial aggressor, acting as a tool for the United States. And China continued to support revolutionary movements, including the Palestinian movements, and anti-colonial struggle in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, all over the period of the Cold War. Uh, however, this changed by the end of 1980s and the beginning of 1990s. Uh, China, for your information, was the first non-Arab country which recognized the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the BLO, uh, as a sole representative of the Palestinians and almost was the first non-Arab country to uh, open an embassy for the Palestinians in Beijing. Uh, however, by 1987, by 1978, uh, with, uh, when Ding Xiaoping came to power, uh, they started to embark a program of the, what is called the four modernizations, and this program significantly transformed the country Political and, in, in, uh, political and economic infrastructure and reshaped the foreign policy in a largely pragmatic form. Uh, so giving less weight to ideology and giving more weight to economy. And uh, uh, for this, China started to soften its historic anti-Israeli policy over the Palestinian issue uh, because they found that it is in their interest to have better economic relations with uh, the Americans, and also uh, they found that the best thing to do is, uh, I mean, to have such good relations to, with the Americans, uh, they found that the key uh, for such getting thing is to have good relations with Israel itself. Uh, I won't go more, I mean, in details with the China case, but the, there are four bases uh, of, uh, I mean, uh, which formulate the China contemporary policy towards the Middle East, including the Palestinian issue. And in this case, we can understand the position of the Chinese. Uh, number one, China increased need for oil, uh, where the Arab oil covers almost 44% of its needs 
Number two, China needs uh, a working uh, relationship with Israel to serve as a vehicle to acquire Western technology uh, through joint Chinese-Israeli projects and also the Jewish capital for investment in China in addition to the support of the Jewish lobby in the American Congress, particularly to voice the Chinese position on controversial issues uh, with the American administration. And number three, China extreme concern with the rising Islamist wave in the Arab region and its repercussions on the heavily Muslim populated areas in Western China. And number four, uh, China's reluctance to engage itself in um, this period in strategic competition with other powers, at least in the foreseeable future, and instead to concentrate on promoting its trade with the Arab region. Uh, having these points into consideration, uh, China had, on one hand, continued its support to the Palestinian issue, uh, but on the same time, uh, it was driven by pragmatic concerns that are very much in line with the international consensus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So they did not went far away from the international consensus on the Palestinian issue, and that's why uh, China started its full political relation with the, the Israelis in January 1992, and China supported various peace initiatives uh, which governed the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, uh, such as the Madrid Conference, the Oslo Accords, the Roadmap, and etc. Uh, China, in general, supported the two-state solution, reaffirmed that East Jerusalem should be the capital of the Palestinian state, and also uh, support the efforts to obtain full membership of Palestine in the United Nations. Also, it maintains its financial support to the Palestinian issue. Uh, so China tried to play a game, uh, which they call it a balanced policy uh, between both sides. Also, China was uh, 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 having a position to recognize Hamas and its government as they are, uh, uh, as they managed to win uh, election in a very transparent uh, election. Uh, so they have this, what they call it, respect of the will of the people. However, on the other side, trade matters, the trade relation between Israel and China skyrocketed. Uh, they started with only foreign trade with 30 million U.S. dollar in 1992, uh, but by 2011, uh, the bilateral rela economic relation between Israel and China uh, reached the amount of 8 billion 160 million U.S. dollar. Uh, so they have much, uh, I mean, this kind of relation very much developed between both sides. Uh, on the other side, we have also China's concern to have very strong economic relation with the Arab co uh, countries and with the Muslim world. Uh, so although the economic relation multiplied many times with the Israelis, here the significance is not only for the bilateral relation with the Israelis, but also the good relations with the Israelis uh, help China to acquire uh, high technology, also buying weapons with the consent or the acceptance or the approval of USA. And this would help China developing its own technology and its own army. On the other side, uh, China have very strong relation with the Arab world. The bilateral or, or the foreign trade uh, with the Arab world uh, uh, reached the uh, in 2008, the amount of 133 billion U.S. dollars. So this means almost uh, 15 times their trade with the Israelis. So they have very, very strong 
economic relation with the Arab countries. Uh, they also, they don't want to lose this. Uh, make more brief and such. Uh, so here, the case of China, that, uh, <clears throat> that when it comes to the Palestinian issue, they will keep their own <clears throat> excuse me, their distinction and, uh, uh, in having strong relation with the Palestinians and supporting the Palestinian issue. But of course, the Chinese will continue trying to avoid conflict with USA. And they will continue uh, through diplomatic means to exhibit their own uh, support to the Palestinian issue, uh, but uh, not far away with the essence uh, and uh, with having a, such a coherent policy uh, very close to the policies of the major powers. Uh, here the point is that uh, same almost, we have the same almost, uh, we have almost the same case with the case of India and I don't want to go with details with the case of India as almost time is running, uh, but also we have the same experience. India was supporting the Palestinian issue and with the side of the Palestinians, but also with January 1992, established their own foreign relations with the Israelis, and also their economic relations skyrocketed from uh, 200 million US dollar in 1992 to more than 5 billion US dollar by last year. However, in the same time, the Indians have their very strong economic relation with the Arab world with foreign trade amounting 143 billion US dollar in 2010. The Indians also have almost 6 million Indian expatriates, workers in the Gulf countries who are uh, uh, in general, making India the world's uh, largest recipient of remittances. Uh, those expatriates transfer more than 50 billion US dollar a year to India from these countries. So also India have very strong relations, yes, with the Israelis uh, nowadays, but in the same time, they have very, very strong relations with the Arab world. Why this happened? In general, uh, these countries feel free to establish and to strengthen their relations with the Israelis because the, Israel, the, the, uh, the Arab world and the Muslim world were disunited, weak, uh, lagging behind. They don't have a very strong policy towards Israel. They went with peace negotiations, which bring nothing to them, but the Israelis make use of such relations to strengthen their power and to maintain their relations, economic and political relations with Asian countries. Uh, my last point here in this case is that because of such weakness and disunity and chaos of the Arab countries, we have the Israelis manipulating this and strengthening their relations with other Asian countries, especially China and India of course, beside Japan and other countries. Uh, but nowadays, we have the so-called the Arab Spring, and Arab countries are generally, this area is boiling, and there are many questions about the future of these countries. We have regi regimes which collapsed in Egypt, in Tunisia, in uh, Libya, in Yemen, and uh, also we have, as you know, what's going on in Syria and other countries. So the region is changing. And the question is, can this continue, the policies of these countries, can it continue in the same way in the future? If we have new regimes in the Arab world that represented the will of the people, and that in this case, the people of this area are very much supporting the Palestinian issue, and uh, this kind of change may produce, uh, produce a new regimes that also in full support of the Palestinian people, as they are 
as long as they are also representing the will of the people. And in this case, the strategic space around Israel will be changing to a hostile one. And also, the new governments will no longer be corrupt or dictatorship, and they will make use of their strong economic relations with other countries like India and China to maintain the support of the Palestinian issue. So they can play their own cards in a bitter way. And in this case, uh, countries like China and India and other countries will think 10 times or 100 times before getting, uh, getting stronger or ma maintaining stronger relations with the Israelis. As their economic relations with the Arab countries are 15 times or 20 uh, times more than or false uh, than their relations with the Israelis. Uh, also, in the last 20 years, uh, countries like India and China uh, managed to stand on their foot uh, and uh, to have very strong economic, uh, I mean, development in their countries. So they are not in their position, which, which was uh, 20 years ago when they were in dire need for economic support and economic relations with the Israelis and the Americans. They managed to develop their own self and they are now in a better and stronger economic position in their own. So uh, it seems to me that if the Arab countries with the, such a change uh, in the area and in the region maintained stronger policies uh, in support of the Palestinian issue and maintained or tried to exploit their stronger relation, economic relation with the Indians and the Chinese and other countries, then there could be a possibility of having a better support to the Palestinian issue from such countries. And these countries may revise their own policies towards the Palestinian issue. The other or the last point in this case is that Israel is still uh, being seen a threat to the stability of the region and to the world peace. And of course, you know all the talks about uh, a potential attack uh, to the Iranians uh, and also continuation of occupation, continuation of aggression, and, this, uh, and these things. And in this case, this area will continue to be uh, boiling with a potential explosion any time. So uh, we should not expect any kind of stability unless the Palestinian people manage to get their full rights, including liberating their land and the right of return of their own people. So it is not only a matter of economic relation to be maintained with the Israelis, but the matter is far uh, away from such thing. It is a matter of justice. It is a matter of the right of the people uh, to liberate their land and to return. And also, it is a matter of ending the last sort of traditional colonization in the history of the world and also ending the last sort of racism uh, being established, I mean, a country established based on racism in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohsen Saleh, for your analysis of the Palestinian issue relating to uh, the relationship with uh, China and, and India. You've given us a very uh, wholesome picture of the relationship. And I think we will open it on to Q&A &A when our panel session ends. Um, I'd like to move on. Uh, Professor Kamal, Kamal Hassan is here with us, but we are only giving him half an hour. Half an hour. And uh, may I call upon Professor Kamal Hassan. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wal mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in 
سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. My respected chairperson, my fellow panelists, distinguished scholars, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. And a very good morning to all of you. Let me thank, uh, first of all, the organizers uh, for inviting me to make this presentation. And um, the title of my paper is The Era of Turbulence and Challenges to the Tradition of Muslim Moderation in the Asia Oceania region. Uh, the basic assumption of my paper is that there is this tradition of Muslim moderation in the Asia-Pacific Oceania region. And that um, tradition is basically the Sunni, the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah tradition in Southeast Asia in particular, and also in Asia-Pacific region. And the challenge is to maintain this tradition um, of Muslim moderation with all the challenges uh, coming from this era of turbulence which um, the world is going through right now. I um, was wondering why the organizers this time talk of Asia Oceania uh, instead of Asia Pacific. Uh, and uh, of course when I check the um, uh, look into the geography of the region, um, I find there's a good reason to, to also be concerned about the Oceania region. Uh, it no, should not just be uh, seen as synonymous with the Pacific because you have about 22 countries and states in Oceania. Uh, anyway, let me not bother you with the geography that should have been settled yesterday. Uh, just to uh, to share with you my, my concern about the choice of Oceania. And when we look at the, the composition of Oceania, uh, I think there is a strong justification for emphasizing Asia-Oceania region. Um, Let me just uh, check this um, up any. Where is one? Or oh, maybe, okay, I saw this, but uh, okay, now, uh, no, this one? Oh, no, no, this is not recording. Are you sure? Oh, okay, I'm so sorry. Now, just. Um, Okay, okay, all right, fine, thank you. Uh, all right, I is it coming out? Yeah. Ah? I cannot see, okay. Thank you very much. Um, my paper is rather long, um, and it's available with the organizers, so I decided to come up with just uh, slides on the, just the topics, the subheadings of my paper. So I begin with uh, number one, scenario of prolonged and painful period of turbulence. And I begin with uh, quoting the uh, words of uh, Prime Minister uh, Putin um, uh, in January 2012. He says, by and large, what the world is facing today is a systemic crisis, a tectonic process of global transformation it is a visible manifestation of our transition to a new cultural, economic, technological, and geopolitical era. The world is entering a period of turbulence, which will be prolonged and painful. We should not be under any illusions. The uh, foreign minister of uh, Russia, Lavrov, writes in his um, article in International Relations in a Turbulence Zone, 
He says, in the outgoing year, that is 2010, international relations have hit a zone of turbulence. So turbulence not just in finance and economics, but also in international relations. And of course, um, the environment is also good.